Welcome to Secrets from the Saddle podcast. I'm Sylvie Dao, your host, fellow cyclist, bike club founder, cycling coach, bike race junkie, just truly super passionate about cycling. My journey with cycling started 20 years ago when I opened a spin studio, started a women's race team, and founded a women's only cycling club called Cycle Fit Chicks. I'm super thrilled to reveal all aspects that make the world of cycling operate. I'm so excited to be able to bring you interesting people from around the world, pro cyclists, recreational cyclists, coaches, event organizers, bike shop owners, everything and everyone you need to know or ever wondered about when it comes to cycling. I know you'll enjoy this episode. This podcast episode is sponsored by Shopify Queen, Sarah Gensel of Gensel & Co. Do you currently have a Shopify site selling products or services that aren't performing as well as you're hoping? Or do you have a product or service you'd love to sell, but you have no idea where to start? Well, my girl, Sarah Gensel, the Shopify queen, is a person to talk to. She is amazing and brilliant at branding and is currently helping me completely revamp my website on Shopify to showcase my new brand and selling my products. So if this sounds like something you've been looking for, please reach out to her at, on IG at Sarah Gensel, that's J-A-N-S-E-L. Leave her the code Sylvie, that's S-Y-L-B-I-E, and she will add you to her free Shopify Facebook group where she coaches weekly on Shopify strategies and has tons of content to help you in your Shopify journey to building your online business. So don't forget, DM her on Instagram at Sarah Gensel, J-A-N-S-E-L, and leave her the code Sylvie. She'll reach out and add you to her community. Thank you very much and have an amazing day and enjoy the episode. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Secrets from the Saddle, All Things Cycling Podcast with your host Sylvie Doe here. And we have Matt Barley, who is actually, this is one of my first touring companies who that goes over to Europe actively and I'm super excited to bring him on here because uh, he was um, he owns a touring company and good friends of mine actually work for him as tour guides and so they put they connected me with Matt and so here's a little bit about Matt before we bring him out so a 24 career as an officer in the Canadian Air Forces was a likely cause of his love of travel and adventure as he continued to fly airplanes all over the world, climb Himalayan peaks, love those Himalayan peaks, and race bicycles for Team Canada. He found himself that in a position that in 2014, he purchased Magic Cycling Adventures, literally living by the Um, delivering his dream of building a company that improves clients lives both physically and emotionally provides his guide provides his guides the opportunity to lead active adventurous lives and give back to the community and charities so welcome matt to our podcast i can't wait to hear all about it thank you very much i uh, consider it an honor as i say i'm a podcast virgin so uh yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to this. Yay. Okay, so as I mentioned, my first question, and usually the only question, is how did you get into cycling and how did it lead you to ride, be racing for Team Canada and then into purchasing or coming to acquire this touring company? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can probably talk for a little bit about something like that. All um, right, let's go. Oh, you know, like every kid, I think I grew up with a bicycle. Um, as Did you have a banana seat bicycle, though? Um, you know what? I think my first bicycle was a uh, was a Mustang with with a banana seat. And uh, now I had two brothers. You do look of the age, though. Yeah, they, <laughs> they're for dating me. Um, dating us <laughs> yeah exactly uh, but I had two brothers that were 10 years older than I was so when I was a little kid they they souped up my bike like you know it was their pet project and I, you know I was like five six years old and uh and they went and pulled up a set of like 
uh, forks, uh, raked out forks off a road bike. And so it kind of turned it into a chopper and put what we call <laughs> a sissy bar in the back. So it was like a, you know, a big bar. That, so I was that kid who was just oh yeah on the street because my brothers built my bike for me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, uh, as I say, I don't think there was anything special about me, um, riding bikes. Uh, all, all the kids in my neighborhood did it. Um, and, um, you know, I grew up on the, or I was born um, down on the West Coast, uh, and my dad was an advertising executive. And like full on, like those, my dad was a madman. As if you've ever seen the show, that's what he did. He lived the lifestyle. You know, there's pictures of my dad with Frank Sinatra and and Sammy Davis. Wow. Jr. And, and, you know, but it was a hard lifestyle. If you've ever seen the show, Mad Men you know, the, the bottle of scotch in the drawer of the desk, things like that. And, uh, and, and he and my mom, you know, a family of four kids. Um, <clears throat> I think it was my mom who said, okay, enough. Like we, <laughs> we like that destroying us. So, um, so dad uh, bought a little ski hill of all things. So he area. bought a ski hill. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> because he loves ski, right? So he's like, yeah. okay, we're going to, we're going to move out of Vancouver and get out of the rat race. And what do I love doing? Well, I like skiing. So we bought this little family run ski hill. He knew nothing about running ski hill, um, but we figured it out. So where was this? Uh, in, in, in the Okanagan in, uh, in West Bank, which is just south of Kelowna. Okay. So I grew up on a ski hill. Um, and if you had to put a pair of skates on me when I was 10 years old, I, my knees would have fallen in together because I, like literally I, I never spent any time doing what all the other kids did after school. I was right on the hill, you know, skiing. I would ski like sometimes 125 days a year. And, and it was my life. Like I grew up watching the crazy Canucks and I was like, I'm going to be a downhill skier and I'm going to mm. race for Canada. And, and that's, that was all I wanted to do. And uh, mm. so I obviously had an active childhood uh -huh. and, uh, um, and then I think I made the national team and two weeks into that, I had a really bad crash in the downhill at Red Mountain, uh, mm. in the interior of BC and my knee, um, you know, I just I blew up my knee and, uh, and I'll never forget sort of the, you know, I was still living at home at the time and, um, you know, the, the doctor came in and, and this is national team doctor. He was the first guy to be doing ortho orthoscopic surgery um, in Canada. So it was still pretty cutting edge at the time. Um, and I just remember him coming in and in the recovery room, sort of having a conversation with me and my dad and saying, look, um, if, if you want to like be able to walk when you're 40, you, you got to stop racing because it was really bad. Um, and so my dad basically looked at me and said, looks like you're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All that's right. it. So, so fast forward, um, you know, what else can I do to go fast? Because that's all I like to do. Mm -hmm. but downhill was my specialty. And, and um, well, I know how about fly jets, uh, you know, because Top Gun had come out. So, wow. Oh, right. Yeah. So I, uh, <laughs> I decided to go, um, I decided to join the Air Force. So I went to, I went to school to Royal Roads Military College in, on Vancouver Island, which is what brought me to where I am now. And um, so, you know, fast forward, um, I, I had a career um, in the Air Force. Um, it was quite a, Let's just say a very, um, it was a varied career, even though I was an Air Force officer. Um, you know, I, I started on the uh, Aurora, uh, which is a maritime patrol aircraft uh, based here in Vancouver Island. You know, it's hunting submarines if it was in, if it was a war or a conflict. But for the most part, we were just a, a maritime patrol aircraft. So the surveillance aircraft of the, of the coast. Um, did that for a number of years and had, had an absolute blast flying all over the Pacific Rim. Um, and uh, and living in Comox, there was a real thriving mountain bike scene. Um, mm. 
And so, you know, I got into that and, and with my buddies that I flew with and, and, and friends that lived in Comox guys, you know, young guys in the bike shop and that was our hangout. And so when I wasn't flying, I was with my buddies and we were just riding and riding and riding. And I just loved mountain biking because it was, it was at a time where um, it was kind of wild, wild west. Um, like we were cutting trails wherever we wanted and building really cool stuff. And, and, you know, like if you had a bike that had front suspension, well, that was, that was pretty awesome. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> nothing like we see now. Um, yeah. So I, I, and I just absolutely loved it. And then I got transferred to Victoria. Um, and um, it was, it was, uh, it was disappointing because there wasn't a, there wasn't much of a mountain biking scene in Victoria at the time. Mm. And, you know, I lived downtown Victoria and then the trails were way out of town. So people would get, people would get on their, like they put their bikes in their cars and then drive to go mountain biking, which what, I was like, what? This is bullshit. Right. Um, and I just <laughs> I actually kind of just fell out of the scene for a while. Um, because I was still spoiled in Comox. We had trails out our back door. Mm -hmm. Now I realize that you know, what most people do is put their bikes on the car. I've got a bike mm -hmm. rack myself. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Funny so, how things evolve, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's funny how things evolve. But in Victoria, there is a super vibrant road scene that still exists today. Um, but you know, like Rolling Green was, was on, you know, like you could go out on a club ride with Rolling Green and, and, and just get your ass handed to you by him. Everyone did, but that's what happened when you ride, when you rode with Rolly. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well maybe I should buy a road bike. And I, like, I, I had a 10 speed as a kid, um, but I was never a road rider. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, a 200 pound guy so you're not going to see me you know winning any koms around here or anything like that. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I started to make friends and they were out riding on the road and i'm like okay and i, I won't, i'll never forget there's a, a mountain bike shop here in victoria called marty's mountain cycle and uh, mm -hmm. and marty dealt brody which at the time oh was that was my first mountain bike uh, Many Love it too. still, actually. So I went in and, and I said, Marty, I think I want to get a road bike. And Brody made these, these Scandium, which is a type of titanium road bikes. And, and Marty said, well, I got this one for you if you want. So I, I bought it. I still have it. It's still hanging in my garage. I love it. Mm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's a real special bike to me. Um, something about them eh yeah, like just, it still yeah. shifts like oh, yeah. a dream like yeah. it's, it's 20 years old right it's still like amazing yeah so um and i just started road riding and uh mm. um met some people uh, you know a guy i used to fly with um he, uh, he was a navigator on seeking helicopters he had a girlfriend who rode the track and we were out one day just noodling around, you know, just kind of riding around on a Sunday. And, um, and he had raced roads. So there was the old, you know, the, the, um, the street sign races. In other words, like if there was a, a yield sign or a stop sign coming up or something, you, you sprint to it. And I'd always mm -hmm. make sprints. Um, so his girlfriend said, Hey, you should probably, come and check out the track uh, and I'd been on a track bike once before in the bike shop that that I mentioned that we hung out in Comox Black's Cycle um, for whatever reason they had a they got a track bike in there and I, I literally fit out in the parking lot scared the shit out of myself <laughs> fell off the thing because I'd never ridden anything yeah 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 fixed gear right and I had no idea anyhow I was, so and that stuck in my head, right? Uh, yeah, you're like, oh, I don't know yeah, about that. <laughs> no break. Yeah. She's like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I've had a bad experience. Anyhow, she talked me into it. Um, I went to the track and, uh, yeah, I was hooked. Like, first time. I just remember mm -hmm. going up the, the Victoria track, which was built for the 84 Commonwealth Games. 
is a 333 meter track. It's oh. super mellow. It's like, it's not steep. You know, it's concrete. There's great friction on it. And even then being up on the rail, I was like, oh, like scared. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I loved it. Like, I was like, this is really cool. And, and then um, I, uh, there was a really, it was, it was the coolest, most vibrant cycling scene that I've been involved with in my life was going on in Victoria at that time at the track. Mm -hmm. um, there was, there was just a lot of people out riding and, and they were just people who were super inclusive. Um, and there was no, there was no ego. There was no pretense. There's none of that sort of like mm. you know, eyeing somebody up. Like you see on, in, in different disciplines of cycling, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just really welcomed with open arms. And, and I'll never forget, there was a, you know, sort of the, the guy at the track, um, you know, national team guy, um, a fellow named Keith Bruno uh, sort of took me under his wing and, and offered to coach me. And like, I'd been riding, I don't know, about four months. I, I, I started the track in the spring and it just so happened that Victoria was hosting the national championships, the national track championships at the Velodrome in August. So, you know, I had, like I say, I had four or five months of, of riding. And, and of course, like I was like, at every track practice, right? Like when there was open track nights, I was out there because it was just so much fun and it was such a great vibe. So I, you know, in a very short time, I kind of learned how to handle myself on the track. Tactics, I had no idea. And, and <laughs> you know, as long as, you know, as long as like, sure. I've been on the track, yeah. I'm like, it took me a while to figure out, like even get the nerve to go around someone. Like that was... <clears throat> So nerve wracking. Exactly. So, um, but as I said, you know, Keith was really good and, and he, tactically the guy is brilliant. So he, he, he taught me quite a bit in a very short period of time. Now, the good thing about having the track nationals in Victoria was that you didn't need to be a national team rider to go on track nationals. You know, track nationals, you can enter, you know, there's, there's masters and, etc cetera, etc cetera. and so i entered right like i'm well what the hell is here so it's a great weekend of fun i get at least i get to walk watch racing and even if i get hammered and and crash or or just get humiliated it doesn't matter because i've been riding for four months mm -hmm. and um you know it, it just went well you know like i I entered the kilo and Keith's like yeah you can do a kilo because you won't take anybody else in the kilo which is the one kilometer time trial Oh, okay. And I'd never done one before. And, and I think, like, what was my time? Like, is that like two laps around or four? It was a 333 track. So it was three laps. Three laps. Was, okay. The standing start, one clock. And okay. the time, I think it was like 110 something. One minute. Holy three. crap. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't know it at the time, but that was pretty good. Like, <laughs> you got Team Canada right there. Hey, well, uh, no, you like no, it wasn't. That? But, but you know, I, I think that at that point, um, you know, Keith pulled me aside and said, "Hey, you know what? Actually, why don't I coach you? Because um, you've got some natural talent." Uh, hmm. and, and so, you know, let's remember that for fourteen, the first like fourteen years of my life, I skied. Yeah. Well, I was strong, right? And, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, that was Your legs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I think I was 30, mid 30s, 34, I think, when I started. And like, so but then by the time that I, you know, did some national team projects and things like that, like, you know, I'm, I'm there with, with Travis and Cam, Yannick, and the guys, and, and they're all like in their 20s and mm -hmm. they're like 10 years older than everybody. Um, but it was a lot of fun, you know, and, and I, I had a blast. Um, you know, did some uh, kind of championships, got a medal there, um, World Cup, and, and 
yeah, so it was, I just, I had a really good time. Like I, you know, it's sort of, obviously my goal was, um, was the Olympics, uh, was, so it would have been Beijing, 2008 Olympics. Um, and I worked my ass off. Like I, I totally worked my ass off. And mm -hmm. so the good news is that I have a full-time job here in Victoria. Uh, I'm not flying anymore. So I'm just, I'm doing a staff job. Um, so it gave me the flexibility to train a lot and to be able to travel. And I was working for the, the Admiral at that time. He was the commander of the West Coast Navy. And he was super supportive of what I did. Like he would, he would give me, you know, in the military, it was called leave without pay. Basically, mm. let me go, you know, if there was a national team project somewhere, he could let me go mm. away and it wouldn't be my vacation days, you know. Right. Okay. You know, so you just weren't paid. Um, because the way he saw it is, well, look, you know, we got a guy in uniform who's representing Canada mm -hmm. um, on an international stage. So why wouldn't we? Um, why wouldn't we support that? So that was really cool. Um, to have that support. Otherwise, there's no way I would have been able to do it. Like if I was a Navy guy, like on a ship, forget it. And there were times yeah. actually when I did have to deploy with the Navy. I went back and I did my, I did a master's degree in underwater acoustics. Um, so oh. sort of a very specialized field. So I was, my job at the time was the oceanographer. So I was, mm. although I was an Air Force guy, I was kind of on loan to the West Coast Navy. I was the oceanographer for the West Coast fleet. Um, and sometimes I did have to go to sea. And I'll tell you, the most challenging thing I've ever done training wise was on my rollers, on the back of a Canadian frigate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, had my rollers, I had my rollers on the, on the helo deck. And I oh, was, I was doing a roller workout, like a session You're like, on this ship that's like, you know, rolling. <laughs> oh so, my gosh. Nice stay on your rollers. Like when you, when you sprint, you know, and you're doing like <laughs> 200 RPM on rollers, it's hard just to stay on them at the best of time. So yeah, I <laughs> had a couple of roller crashes there and, you know, the Navy guys are looking at me like, look at this idiot. But <laughs> you know, we did what you had to do. Um, both of you stand beside me so I don't fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then the, man, it's a bit of a good news and a bad news story, is that A, the men's sprint team who qualified for Beijing but Canadian Cycling Association didn't mm. Oh. Um, yeah. And for reasons that were their own. So uh, the long and short of it is after that, I'd say within the year, everyone, every one of the guys on the sprint team, we were done. We're, Just we're gone. For the sport. What's the point? Yeah, I guess if you train that hard and you don't get the opportunity, eh? and especially when there's no uh, no reasoning, it kind of wears on you, right? Well, like, why am I here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Why, like, why did we just bust our ass for four years? Yeah, for like the last, you know, two, X number of years, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but the good news was mm -hmm. I absolutely loved the journey. Like the process, mm -hmm. the work, the training, and and going, you know, going to races in the states and and, and you know, overseas and things like that was awesome. Like everybody loved it. Um, and yeah, so that was that. Um, and uh, not soon thereafter, Vancouver was awarded Winter Olympics. Oh, that was two thousand eight. Well, two thousand eight was Beijing. And then 2010 was Vancouver. And um, yes, yes, yes. So I think you know, by virtue of my involvement in sport, national level stuff, um, and the fact that the Olympics were here on the West Coast, and through various things, um, the 
the Canadian Forces um, appointed me as the liaison officer to the 2010 Olympics to Vanock, the Vancouver Olympic Organizing Committee. Nice. And it was a really, a really cool job um, because I got to work alongside, um, you know, John Furlong and, and the organizing committee. Uh, even though I was a guy in uniform, I didn't wear a uniform, I wear a suit like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I was working, you know, at Bannock. And um, I had the opportunity, you know, I went there as a Canadian first liaison. I, I'll, never, I'll never forget the chief of defense staff telling me, um, you know, I, I had a conversation with him and I said, you know, what do you want me to do here? And he basically said, if it reflects well upon the Canadian forces, if they ask you to do something that, you know, doesn't really have anything to do with army or, or you know, security stuff. Um, he says, but you think that it would reflect well upon the Canadian forces, say yes to it. So it was awesome. So I had, you know, like I had the ability to do some really cool things um, with the organizing committee. Uh, um, like really diverse roles, uh, you know, stuff where I was taking, we were taking um, as, as an initiative to, to engage youth in sport, which is, you know, the, the games aren't just all about athletes racing and competing. There's a whole cultural aspect of the Olympics. And, and, and it's basically using sport to promote, you know, healthy lifestyles and using sport mm -hmm. to promote peace and things like that. So what we did, I, I put together an initiative where we threw, I think about 16 different communities all scattered throughout Canada's Arctic, like really remote communities where, you know, the ones that are mm -hmm. at the end of the ice roads, for example, um, we, we had a Canadian Forces aircraft and we had some Olympians in there and we had the mascots and we had like these massive boxes full of sports equipment. So I, you know, onboarded um, a bunch of equipment supplier companies. So we basically showed up and we're like, hey, boom, here's, here's like everything you need to get the kids in your community playing baseball, playing soccer, playing football. We had hockey equipment and all that sort of stuff. So that was really cool. Like it was just a, an amazing experience for me. And then after the Olympics were over, I was like, I can, I'm not going to top that. Like, you know, like if I stay in the military, I'm not going to get a better job than that. So to me, it was time to, to pull the pin. And, and it had been, you know, an amazing 20 some odd years during which I was able to race my bike for Canada and, and, and all that sort of stuff. I, I should mention that after Beijing, after um, I, I just, I didn't look at a bike for probably a couple of years. Um, oh no. And then it was a, it was, you know, a bit of a sour taste and yeah, that, that training at that level, it's just, it's nice to take a break from the bike for a while. Yeah. Um, so I did. And, uh, and I retired from the military and um, so, let me go ahead. Did, did you know Ron from the military? Yeah, that's how I met Ron. It's, oh, okay. Ron, um, because Ron was a marathoner and, uh, um, and like a, mm -hmm. yeah, a marathoner and triathlete and, and was a pretty serious runner um, mm -hmm. back then. And, I met him at each year the Canadian Forces does a um, we call it the Canadian Forces Sports Awards. Um, so because you know the sports are a huge part of the military, right? And, and I wasn't the only guy competing in, in, in something outside of um, my job, and so they mm -hmm. recognize people doing that, and they have a big get together every year and you get together and, and, you know, they select the athlete of the year and the Canadian forces and things like that. And so at one of those dinners, um, I was invited um, and, uh, and I met Ron. Yeah. Uh, he, he actually gave me the, I think Ron was up there and he gave me the award that I received. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
And then it's like, oh, you're in Victoria. I'm in Victoria too. And you got to remember, I'm an Air Force guy and he's a Navy guy, right? So we um. oil and water, but he, we totally <laughs> got on. Like he was a <laughs> guy. He was he's a super nice guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you know, that planted that seed. Uh, and then fast forward, like, God, that would have been. So like wife and kids fast forward or like yeah like seven or eight years later <laughs> where I'd met yeah mom. I'm out of the military mm -hmm. uh, I had um, mm -hmm. started working with a fellow uh, doing a lot of entrepreneurial stuff um, mm -hmm. real estate development um, buying and selling franchises developing franchises. wow really yeah yeah because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up right. Um, <laughs> <and> yeah <laughs> you're still cycling i'm like i gotta get out of this mindset what am i gonna do yeah to make money <laughs> um but the cool thing was the fellow that i was working for um was you know he he really took me under his wing he's a great guy he the founder of century 21 realty actually so like a, a serial entrepreneur really successful guy and, and he's like look i'll um come work for me and I will, what did he call it? He called, I'll give you a living MBA basically. Right. So he, he was, yeah. He, he, That's brilliant. He, I love it. Yeah. And, <laughs> a lot of that going on these days. Yeah. Peter Thomas is his name and he really took me under his wing and, and mentored me and sort of, you know, you got to remember, I have like, you know, my being in the military, you don't, there's no entrepreneurship or anything like that. You, mm -hmm. you get a great set of, of skills, like decision-making skills and, 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 you know, what to do when things go sideways and stuff like that. But the ins and out of business. Yeah, no. Um, so Peter taught me that and, uh, and it served me really well. And I think for about four years, um, I was working with him four or five years and, uh, at that point, I was going back and forth between a week here in Victoria, which is home, and then I'd go to Phoenix and I'd fly to Phoenix for a week because oh. that was the that's where the the head office was for his company. And this is a company that was basically buying and building existing franchises. So taking something that's you know got four stores and turning it into two hundred stores across North America. Wow. The cool thing about it was I was I had the opportunity to look doing the due diligence, I had the opportunity to, to look at a whole bunch of different businesses, right? They'd all come across my desk. Mm -hmm. My idea was look, I don't want to do this forever, but eventually a business is going to come across my desk that I think is really cool. And then I'll have the opportunity maybe to buy in, right? Yeah. Um yeah, it never worked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting, just yeah. waiting for that business what, to come across. When <laughs> is that going to happen? <laughs> well, I thought it would, um, but it didn't. Um, now, all through that, when I finally mm. decided to get back on a bicycle, um, and I was like, how, how am I going to light that fire again? I, I don't want to go back to the track. And, and, you know, I just, so I was trying to figure out how I could, reignite my passion for riding mm -hmm. and i thought i got an idea you know i'm a guy who's whose events lasted no more than a minute right as a kilo rider or as a sprinter right uh team sprint or or, or match sprint which is three laps of the track and you're done right so like go fast turn left and <laughs> um, but, uh, why don't I try something that I'm really shitty at, like long distance? So I, so I signed up with a buddy oh. for a seven day <laughs> mountain bike stage race. Um, Is that the one in Whistler? Uh, no, no, it was Trans Rockies. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I signed up for Trans Rockies. <laughs> oh my God. Well, you're used to be a mountain biker. So that's. Uh, uh, yeah, but. A long time ago, days like we're talking a stage race here, right? This is yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I thought, well, that'll definitely um, that'll be different. So that'll be a good way to, <laughs> to uh, break in the whole body all at once. Yeah, 
And, and it did. Um, <laughs> I, my partner in the race was a guy who, you know, was a, um, like a nine hour Ironman guy. So, you know, he was an endurance machine. And, and here I am, you know, 208 pounds with, you know, 29. I can go fast for one minute. <laughs> exactly. Right. And now I'm like, okay. So I uh, started riding the road bike and and started getting back on the mountain bike and 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 I had an absolute blast. So raced the Trans Rockies a couple of times and uh, with a really good crew of guys and mm. and I was back in love with cycling and, that, and mm. my life was really good because cycling because of that cycling. Um, yeah. And I introduced my best friend who was an ultra runner into cycling, um, an Irish guy and. Uh, and he was looking for something new. Um, and he and I were, you know, I, I've known him for, for decades. He's my, my go-to climbing partner. We've climbed all over the world together. Um, and so I got him into cycling. And being who he is, he's just, you know, became obsessed with it and became a very good, very fast. Um, and then uh, he did trans rockies with us one of the years and then decided that he wanted to start he wanted to try a mountain bike or a, a road ride stage race so he signed up for the tour trans alp which is a seven-day stage race through the alps in europe uh, and <laughs> and he signed up with a company called magic places cycling adventures that he oh okay and somebody said yeah those guys they they do the race support package, go with them. And so he was doing that and I had no interest and he did it and, and had the time and then got to know the owner uh, of Magic Places during that race and then decided that he was going to take his wife and they were going to go and do a three week um, South African tour with Magic Places. He had so much fun, you know, on, on that race that he's, and, and really liked Jurg, the, the fellow who owned the company, and went and did South Africa with him. And uh, and I remember him coming back with, from South Africa. And like, this is amazing. Like, we had so much fun showing me pictures. And, um, that looks like a blast. So on that trip, as he's having, you know, a beer with the owner, he finds out that the owner is thinking of, you know, dialing it back and maybe selling the company. Now, Mark knew that I was looking for something. Ah, so he you just had to get yourself back into the cycling business to find the right opportunity. Exactly. So he called me and said, hey, I think that I should set up a dinner and you and your should, should come because this guy's looking at selling his company and this, and he said, like, this is made for you. Um, so, yeah, he, uh, I, I went over to Vancouver from from Victoria and Jörg, who lived in, in the Kootenai, um, BC, he drove down, we had dinner, we had a you know, lovely fella, uh, had a great dinner, and by the end of the night, we knew that I was going to buy this company. We didn't know any of the terms, we didn't know how much I was going to pay, we didn't know when I was going to buy, <laughs> but we were both damn sure that I was going to buy that close to cycling adventures. And from that point forward, it, uh, it, it happened very quickly. In, uh, 2014, um, bought the company, and uh, and on the provision that your the fellow I was buying the company from, would stay on as a guide for me mm -hmm. for at least three years, so that I could learn from him. Right. Um, yeah, and I did, and I haven't looked back since. Um, you know, obviously the last two years has been tough because COVID killed international travel and that's what yeah. we do. We are an international bike tour company. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, thank goodness uh, it, we're back. You know, we survived. So, uh, yeah, so what did you do in the meantime to, did you just think about new business ideas well, and like to yeah. expand on it or? Yeah, sort of. Um, when COVID hit, uh, like it just, the, you can't really say it hit at the worst time, but, um, things were going really well. Like we, um, I started, 
doing charity rides on behalf of, uh, there's a Canadian charity, Ottawa based, um, Wounded Warriors Canada. And okay. Wounded Warriors provide support programs mm -hmm. for police, first responders, fire, uh, military who suffer from what they call operational stress injuries, basically PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the biggest non-governmental funding body for these programs um, in Canada. And uh, so what they decided to do was put on what they call a battlefield ride. And oh. so the battlefield ride essentially takes a group of Canadians. Um, you know, it, it, it's a charity ride. So much like mm -hmm. the, the Conquer Cancer or you know, ride for this or that, you sign up, you raise a bunch of money. And then you come on the ride. Well, their rides are in Europe and they, you know, we've taken that. So I started working with them and with my military background, it was a really good synergy. Um, and, uh, and I've been lucky enough for the last six, seven years to, to be their tour provider. I, basically we put the whole thing on for them. Okay. We in Northern France, we've taken people to Italy, so it's a, it's a week-long ride, um, and you visit all these um, historical stops where Canada participated, mm. you know, as, as, a, as you know, usually World War I, World War II, but we've also gone to Bosnia and Croatia, where there was the breakup of, the Yugoslav, of Yugoslavia, um, and these are all places where Canadian forces have participated to try and help people. So I started taking that on. And so the company just was, was doing amazing. It was growing hand over fist. Um, and I was having the best time I've got. My model is, is, is not like my competitors where, you know, if you're going to go on a backroads tour to Tuscany, for example, your guide will be, Giuseppe, or your guides will be Giuseppe and Vito um, from Italy. And then if you want to go on another tour to France, it'll be Pierre and Jean-Michel. And But you'll never see Vito and, and Giuseppe again, unless you go back to Tuscan, right? Because that's what oh. the guy. But okay. the guides are, I've, I've got five core, five core guys. And, uh, and I use the same guys all over the place. So I would send Pete and, and Ron, for example, to Tuscany, if you want to do a magic places tour in Tuscany, and you ride with Pete and Ron, who are Canadian, who speak Canadian but who know, you know, uh, who have the local knowledge and, and things like that, because we've been there. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to do a trip to Argentina, might not be Pete and Ron, might be Ron and Heidi, but hey, it's Ron again. So, so I use that same core and we've got an 84% customer return rate. So, wow. so we just call it magic place. It's family. It's, it's great when you show up in Mallorca and you write like, oh, I've ridden with all these people before or, or a whole bunch of them before. Yeah. It creates great cohesion. And, you know, like I say, we get groups who come on a tour with us who'd never met each other before. And the next year or two years later, that group calls us up and says, hey, let's go here. We want to do this trip. Um, so it's, it's, it's really cool because, you know, we don't do massive group tours mm -hmm. aside from the charity, right? Um, we, we do small, you know, what we call small group OT tours. Um, and it's great because here it's just riding with friends. Um, so, and, and mm -hmm. things were, things were going along very swimmingly. When COVID hit, um, <laughs> and could go anywhere. Um, so we pivoted, and once the the real lockdown started or eased, sort of after that first year, and you could you could leave your province, you could leave your town. Yeah. Then we started working on um, some local BC tours. 
And we, we've always <laughs> done tours in BC, like Calgary to Vancouver is a, is a great road tour itinerary that we do. Or, um, but with gravel riding becoming so popular over COVID, um, we started putting on gravel tours. So although we weren't taking people to Spain, to France, to South Africa, to Colombia, Morocco, um, we were managing to survive by running some some stuff here in BC. Uh, cool. You know, we do South Okanagan wine and culinary tours. We do um, gravel tours through the Rockies over the continent. <gasps> we do, Whoa. Uh, that must be really nice. Like. Yeah. It's off road like cold. oh that would be so pretty in the middle of nowhere like yeah really ride over the continental divide um and uh Ooh. so do you still do those now or are yeah, you getting yeah. back into europe yeah. no so that's the silver lining of covid right is that pre-covid you know we were pretty much an international um, small group tour company, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I say, whether it's South Africa or, Colombia or, or the Pyrenees, the Alps, the, things like that. But COVID caused us to look in our own backyard and mm -hmm. the gravel was becoming so popular. So we started building these tours and we realized, wow, like we're onto something here. Mm -hmm. So just you know, now 2022, for example, we've got we've got a really robust international um, tour schedule. But in addition to that, you know, we're doing a, a Vancouver Island. We're doing two separate gravel tours on Vancouver Island. Um, you know, we're doing from from Nelson to Banff through the Rockies again. Oh, cool! Yeah. And those are pretty much sold out. Not fully sold out, but like, yeah, right away. Um, so the, the appetite, Jeez. Yeah, yeah. are you on like, um, uh, logging roads? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So BC has, I think it's, what was the statistic? I think it's 1.7 million kilometers. Logging um, roads. Right. It's insane. And, and I, I used to tree plant. In oh, BC, and like in out of Prince George, yeah. and we treat like yeah. So they're just everywhere. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, um, so we definitely, yeah, we spend a lot of time on on, on forestry roads, and but uh, you know, not in logging season. I hope. No. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You have to know which roads are active, right? Um, right. <laughs> so one of the problems is that a lot of people when they go gravel riding, they just ride in what I like to call the Green Corridor, which is a gravel road with 100 foot tall fir trees on either side of it. And you're just in a Green Corridor and you don't see anything. It, mm -hmm. So we've, we've worked really hard to, to, to use a bunch of different sources. Um, trails and you know, the the rockies trip for example um you're riding anything from old rail trail um, to designated community um multi-use trail uh, to single track uh, cross-country ski trails um, <sighs> access road yeah road. Yeah, it's really cool what you can put together with by by doing the homework. And you know, we obviously go in and, and do the recon on all of these to to make sure it's viable. And <laughs> it's a it's a massive challenge, right? To have mm -hmm. a support van and a trailer where you've got people who are riding in the middle of nowhere and then they'll come out onto a river. And you know, there's the van and, and the trailers open, and we've got a huge picnic spread. With, you know, with oh, spread. so so let's talk about those those gravel um, events. Um, what is so? Explain like just um, the details of one of those Canadian gravel tours. Is it a full week? Is it like how long do you ride? 
per day? Like, what does it look like? Yeah. So on average, uh, one of our gravel trips is about a week long. Okay. Yeah. And the distance per day? Depends on the trip. So we've got a Southern Vancouver Island gravel tour that that is like sort of our intro to gravel riding. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't need to be a, a, you know, you don't need to be a mountain biker and have all these super strong technical skills. So right. that one is, that's our gateway drug. Um, mm -hmm. right? Because so something like that, you'd ride 50, 40 to 50 K. Um, in a day um, right. and not super technical terrain. Right. Whereas the Rockies gravel tour, <laughs> new 85, um, you know, the, the day over the continental divide is a very committing day. It's about 85 K. Um, like, and all the way up. very remote. Um, um, but, but certainly rideable. But, mm. uh, and um, so when we sell our tours, we also give them a rate so that someone's not jumping into something that they're going to get over their head because people are paying money for us to give them a great experience. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is take someone's money and then have them have a horrible time because it's too easy or it's too hard or they feel intimidated, right? So, so and that's the, that's the value of, of these, these boutique tours, these small group tours is that you don't just sign up and, and show up and, and hope for the best. You know, we communicate with the clients beforehand to make sure that, that they know exactly. Um, Have you been riding lately? Yeah. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Look, there's Strava account. Um, I see you have not been riding in the Probably. three months leading up to. I don't know if this is for you. <laughs> you know, for us, it's just about being very clear with um, with the client as to you know here's here's what you can expect. And so numbers like distances and elevations mm -hmm. are only distances and elevations. Mm -hmm. Do not speak to the experience, right? Um, you know, if, if we know that we're going somewhere where weather is going to be an issue then you know an easy ride can be can, can become an epic if you're mm. stuck out there so you know that's our responsibility is to make sure that we've got um you know that we've got protocols in place to take care of people when those eventualities hit yeah and i think that that's just the advantage of going with a tour company versus yeah hey let's get a bunch of buddies and go and ride <laughs> with 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 the road the research, anybody could could put together the route that we've got, for example, um, and on the North Island. But the difference is, if you want to do that unsupported, then you're doing it with like full panniers, um, loaded gear, and you know, sleeping on the side of the road or, or finding somewhere to put a tent, things like that. Right, right, right. For us. You know, you've got you've got a support vehicle. You've got a, a trailer that you know we do a, a luxury glamping site, and and then a ah. of, we're going to put you in a hotel. Like we we adjust the route so that we can go through a small town, so that you've got a warm shower and a warm bed, so that you're not living feral for a week. <laughs> do you have those feral tours, um, like all out camping experience, or you're more of the no, the no, higher no. end? <laughs> Because there's, there's, there's no business in that for us. I'll be honest with you. Right. I mean, people are doing that on their own, seriously. But you can't make it a better experience for them than they're making it for themselves. Yeah. So, what about um, your tour guides? So, how many people do you take on a tour like that, and how many tour guides do you have per per person, like per group uh, of people? So, well, okay. So, we've got a custom trip. We've got a group of of people in Vancouver that um, a number of them are longtime clients and they said hey there's there's a thing on northern Vancouver Island called the the North Island 1000 and it's a thousand oh. kilometer off-road route that was originally developed by like motorcycle and ATV 
Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It became a bit of a thing. And then sure enough, some cyclists decided that looks like a fun thing to try on a bike. Um, <laughs> so these guys came to us and said, hey, Matt, like, why don't you, can, can we put together a trip? And, and you know, we've only got eight days, though. <laughs> like, well, you're not going to write a trip <laughs> on eight days. But <laughs> we could do half of it. So, you know, and that's the thing. So we've got a dozen guys who, on a trip like that. You know, most of our trips, 12 is not. Um, okay. It's that's... just, it, it's better for a group dynamic. Um, you, know, you get to know people better. You get mm -hmm. to know relationships. Um, and so on that trip, for example, we're going to have, I'll have 12 riders. We'll have um, a guide, uh, like a ride guide. Then we'll have someone driving support. Mm -hmm. We've got someone doing camp support, for example. So we're doing, so that is an eight night trip. Four nights we're in commercial accommodation, um, but then four nights we're camping. So, Your club. Um, um, so I've got three people supporting a dozen, um, one of which is a chef, like my mm -hmm. is in charge of the camp, he's a designated chef. So, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna come into camp and there's gonna be, you know, full barbecue spread, smoke scent. You know, as I say, we, we do it up nice so that even when you're sleeping in a tent that night, you're sleeping in a tent with a full belly of great food and, and mm -hmm. great wine. So. Nice. So, well, that sounds super exciting. I'm like, hmm, gravel stuff, eh? I'm going to have to go back to your website and take a closer look. Because I was, before I, I was on here, I was looking at the Mallorca because everybody's been to Mallorca in Ottawa. And I'm like, oh, well, uh, one of these days. Um, but uh, that is kind of the continental divide. That's kind of cool. Um, that's intriguing. Um, but so. So let's uh, finish it up with um, just sharing maybe a last plug uh, for our listeners um, and where they can find you and um, yeah, and what you have planned. Because I know I, it looks like you have a full itinerary. I know you just came back from Spain, but yeah, uh, but uh, well, I don't do all this, right? you know, it's, I don't want to hog all the good stuff. Um, oh, so, what? <laughs> So, yeah, what is, uh, so first of all, our website is www.magicplaces.ca. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's got our 2022 calendar. Um, mm. which is always evolving because um, as we sell out trips, we tend to put more trips on. Um, uh, so what have we got going on? Well, we just came back from Mallorca. Um, and we're off to, uh, we've got a Vancouver Island gravel tour, which still has a couple of spaces on it. Um, yeah, we've got that Northern Vancouver Island, that's sold out, uh, that tour. Uh, we're in France for the Battlefield Ride. Uh, in June, uh, we're doing Tour Trans Alp support package for that seven day stage race that I mentioned. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, we've been doing that since the race actually began. I think we're on our 17th year of doing tour training. Holy Wow, cool. Uh, yeah, what else are we doing? Please um, put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> What's your calendar look like? Come on. Yeah, we're, taking a, we're taking a dozen ladies to Alsace in July to ride and watch the last Bit of the tour? Pages of the female of the women's tour to <gasps> Oh, cool. Okay, so here's the last question. If I have a group, you just said a group of women. So if I had a group who wanted to go somewhere and ride, I can hire you to kind of put it together? That's, yeah. That, like. Oh, and so you would quote a price for this said trip, not including airfare, um, to take care oh that's yeah and and that is our biggest our fastest growing business line you know as i, as I mentioned that the 84 percent of the people that come back you know mm -hmm. who who meet new friends and they're like they're a group who's on a tour and they're like they 
they want to ride with each other again. And you know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll sign up and come back to my work over this or we'll come to South Africa or, or what have you. But, but a lot of them are like, you know, we've been talking and we, were, we really want to go and ride in the Algarve in Portugal. So we're like, okay. And so I put, I put a trip together in Portugal. Um, if, if it's an area where we haven't been, then we'll go and do the recon on that to make sure that everything is, is dialed. Yeah, because then you can use it again. Yeah. And so that's why there's very few places that we haven't been, right? Because Oh, you know, cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I need to get myself on a trip. Yeah. Come to my Cycling. Trip. That's where you want to ride. Where? Morocco. Yeah. That's... Morocco. I've heard Costa Rica is starting to open up. Really? Yeah. For off-road or road riding? I've heard road riding. Wow. I don't know. I can't remember who told me that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's worth checking. I don't know, but I've heard it's more, well, I'm not sure what side yeah. either. Interesting. But I uh, just had to add some surfing in there. Well, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's not the perfect vacation, right? Ride your bike. I know. Live on the beach, do a little mountain biking. But uh, anyways, this has been amazing. I'm really glad that uh, Heidi hooked me up. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank you and I want to thank all of our listeners. I hope that this, this intrigued every one of you to go and check their website and see what they've got going on. Um, book yourself into a trip before they're all sold out. Hey, and so. uh, I really appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome, Matt. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And so, like I mentioned, everybody, follow them. They are on Instagram. They're on Facebook. They're on Twitter. Uh, their website is magicplaces.ca. And also follow the podcast on Instagram. And plus, make sure that you sign up for the newsletter so that you don't miss an episode. So with that, have an amazing day. And thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you so much for spending this time with me on the Secrets from the Saddle podcast, learning more about sighting people, places, and things that make cycling such an exciting sport. I am so glad you stopped by today. Please leave me a review if you feel so moved to do so. I would love to hear your feedback. And if you could take one second to share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it, I would be forever grateful. Also, if you could please leave me a review, if you feel so moved, by going to iTunes and leaving me an honest thought and an honest comment, telling me what you think, and most importantly, tell me what you'd like to hear more of. It would really help me to bring more great, inspiring cycling stories to you. Until then, have an amazing day. Make sure you ride your bike. And don't forget to visit my YouTube channel if you'd like to see the full version of this podcast live.